So about our guest tonight, uh, Tendai Laxton Beatty, he served as finance minister of Zimbabwe uh, from 2009 to 2013. He is the current member of parliament for Harare East constituency. And the vice president of the Citizens Coalition for Change. He was born in Zivarase Kwa Harare. From 1980 to 1985, he attended a Koromonzi High School, where he was appointed deputy head boy in 1985. He enrolled at the University of Zimbabwe Law School uh, as a freshman in 1986. In 1988 and 1989, BT was the secretary general of the University of Zimbabwe Student Representative Council, where Terry Mungu was the SRC president. And this SRC led student protest against government censorship in academia. After school, he joined the law firm Honey and Blankenberg, where he became the youngest partner. I think technology is playing a number for Umzala right there. Uh, but I think he wanted to add that our Honourable became the youngest partner by the age of 26. Um, so for me, I'm very excited to have you here, Honourable. In fact, I was even trying to practice what I would call you today, whether I call you Minister, Honourable, or just Tendai. And I'm, uh, I'm a very informal person. Tendai is fine. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, no, you can go ahead with the next segment. Fantastic. So, um, tonight, whilst you're close to the mic, I have pressing questions around the history. I mean, we've touched on the fact that uh, you worked in law. So I want to understand the process that led to your appointment as finance minister. Uh, you know, it's, it's a bit unusual for um, a lawyer to be a appointed finance minister. So if you can talk us through that, I'll be grateful. Thank you. I, in fact, studied uh, economics at A-level. And so when I went to university, I went into a law school that was very, that was very, you know, uh, literate. That was very expansive. Yeah, that was very international. That was very cosmopolitan. Uh, and one of the things that I did was uh, I became a student of Marxism. Uh, I studied, uh, you know, Karl Marx, Adam Smith, ETC. So all that is political economy. Political economy is, in fact, uh, economics. Uh, and then when we formed, uh, when we formed the, the MDC in 1999, leading up to 2000, in 2000, they made me secretary for land. They also made me shadow uh, foreign secretary, shadow a, a international relations secretary with Mrs. Sekai Wollent as our party secretary for international relations. So as all of you know, land was very, it was a topical issue uh, in 2000. Uh, the issue of Zimbabwe's relations with the international community also became topical in 2000. So in 2002, uh, uh, I was kind of demoted, if you like. Uh, some people felt that uh, uh, some hands were needed on land and on international relations. So when I was demoted in inverted commas, I was given, I was made secretary for economics. But this, in fact, was a blessing in disguise because all along the MDC had been always accused of having no police. And we had, at that time, an uh, economic a blueprint called the bridge uh, which had been authored by ed cross and others which was extremely a uh, right-wing and uh, neoliberal so i was then given the task of writing a brand new economic blueprint uh, for the mtc so i recruited in my committee uh, extremely powerful uh, individuals people like uh, dr dan Dela, one of zimbabwe's finest economists uh, uh, peter robinson uh, I would arguably say Zimbabwe's greatest economist, uh, and a few others. So for two years, we started researching on countries that had walked similar paths to us, uh, uh, Ghana, uh, Kenya, Zambia, uh, 
we also uh, uh, studied uh, the, the Scandinavian countries uh, where the social democratic uh, ideology, Sweden, uh, Norway, uh, Denmark, we paid study. <laughs> visits to African countries we stayed we paid study visits to uh, to to these Scandinavian countries and in 2004 we produced a blueprint called uh, restart uh, which I would maintain that it's easily the most well written the most robust economic blueprint produced uh, by any political party in Zimbabwe and, and by government itself so that again made me so entrenched uh, in economics, apart from my uh, academic training. And so when the government of national unity came, uh, we, there was a problem. And the problem was that uh, inflation was 500 billion percent in 2008. There was massive non unemployment. Like now, our people were dying uh, like flies. 4,000 people were dying in Zimbabwe per week in 2008. 10 months, 160,000 people. More than the uh, more than the 50,000 people or so that perished during 25 years uh, of the liberation uh, 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 struggle. Uh, there were empty shelves, those all of you uh, know. So nobody wanted uh, economics. Nobody wanted the Minister of Finance. So ZANU-PF gave it to us. And in the party, uh, 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 President Changirai uh, felt that uh, they to put a strong man. And fortunately or unfortunately, uh, I was appointed... Uh, to be Minister of Finance. Um, so in some ways, <laughs> it was a poison chalice, uh, but I'm very grateful to uh, President Morgan Changirai uh, for appointing me. Uh, and so that's how I became uh, Minister of Finance. I was intrigued by that answer. I wanted to add that, um, you know, obviously having to pick up that responsibility, what would you say were your biggest challenges in that particular role? Well, I'll tell you a story, a true story that happened, just to illustrate the humongousness, the enormity of the problems I faced. The government of national unity started work on Monday, the 16th of February, 2009. Uh, we had been sewn in uh, the previous uh, uh, Friday, the 13th, uh, at State House. So when I, so I was working at Hannen Breckenbeck as a partner and so forth. And I didn't even resigned or given them notice. And I'd spent like 18 years at Anand Blackenbeck, success, successful lawyer, doing these big cases that uh, you all used to, to, to read. Uh, so I, I, I drove to the Minister of Finance. Uh, in fact, my partners at Anand Blackenbeck said, Tendai, get away from here. You've got a job to, to, to play. Uh, and so I walked into the Minister of Finance, a long corridor, dark, very ill-lit, uh, those of you who have read The, the Heart of Darkness, uh, it's like when Watson is walking down a passage and there are women knitting and people are looking for him and saying, are you crazy? You want to get a job to be the captain of a ship that is going to uh, Zaire, Congo? Are, are you crazy? So there were these people who were looking at me from corridors. All the corridors, were, all the doors were open and people were just looking at me. They'd heard that I was coming. And also I had this reputation of being a strong man so people were curious, but people were so saying, but you must be mad, you are Sharapela. How can you go into <laughs> to a job where there is no money, inflation is 500 billion percent, it is... But anyway, I get into this office, they introduce me, I see my secretary, uh, 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 Mrs. Joa, then the big guns come, the permanent secretary, Willard Mangongo, comes, the, he's number two, Fungwakunaka, the director of budgets, come in, and they say, ah, minister, so we, we, you know, we exchange greetings. And I said, Minister, tomorrow is payday. So it's payday, okay. So uh, how much do we have to pay? Uh, 30 million US dollars. Uh, how much do we have in the bank account? 4 million US dollars, say. So I say, so where are we going to get the 26 million US dollars? Uh, say, we are, we are actually waking, uh, waiting for you. So <laughs> how do I... It's a, and it's a true story. It's a true story. So I said, but how, where do I get the $26 million? So what I did was, uh, what I did was when everyone had left, I went on my desk and and I took out a Bible and actually started praying and said, God, you haven't brought me here to fail. Uh, you have never failed me. You know, you, I mean, 
you know, and, and you can't, because you, you can't make me fail. So I realized then and then that this was a, a challenge. So, so what I said to myself is that I need a plan. If I don't have a plan, I'm going to sink. So on that very same day, around 5 p.m., on the 16th, I called my friends, those that I'd worked with uh, when we wrote a restart in the MDC. I called Dr. Dan Dela. I called um, a, a, a Peter Robinson. Uh, I've got another friend that I haven't, we- that I haven't mentioned, whom I'm very close to. Uh, some of you can Google him. He's called Patrick Bond. He's a massive uh, author. Uh, he's an expert on economics and an expert on environmental issues. He has written uh, massively and extensively uh, on economics. He is currently teaching at uh, PhD students at University uh, of Vitz, uh, but at the time he was teaching at uh, uh, University of KwaZulu Natal. He has worked for the ANC on gear and on RTP, writing it and editing it. So I've, I found this gentleman. I said, "Look, I have a, a task here. I need to start working on a blueprint, but unfortunately, I don't have time." Uh, so 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 we agreed on some modalities peter was actually in london so he came down and we started working at uh, that very same week we started working at uh, dr dangela's house uh, in in mount pleasant but in the ministry of finance there's a research department it's called the fiscal uh, affairs uh, department so there were so many blueprints the undp had produced a, a blueprint uh, the reserve bank of zimbabwe had produced some blueprints and the Ministry of uh, the OPC, the Office of the President Cabinet, it also, you know, it come up with a blueprint. How do we come out of this hyperinflationary? So I looked, I read these documents, and I realized that on that day, the 16th, they were rudimentary. You know, they were rudimentary. So, so I knew that I had to deal with four things. Uh, so, so you asked me what, what, what was, you know, what, what went on through my mind. So the first thing I said people are going to judge me on one thing and one thing alone. Am I, am I capable of dealing with the hyperinflation? Remember, hyperinflation was 500 billion percent. Remember, the price of good would change three times while it's doing in the supermarket. So I had to deal with hyperinflation. I had to deal with the a ravaged exchange rate. Uh, remember, by that time, the government had printed a hundred thousand trillion dollar note which couldn't buy you a uh, two bottles of soda a fanta or or, or cream soda uh, so i knew i had to deal with the current issue number three i had to deal with much massive shortages uh, of just basic stuff uh, in the supermarket uh, and you know i'd been prisoned i'd been prisoned the government had prisoned imprisoned me in july may june july uh, they only released me after the by-election in 2000, in 2008. So when I came out of prison, uh, I, I took 300 US dollars to my supermarket. But you recall at that time when you exchanged, there was, they were different, there was a multi-tire exchange rate regime, just like now. And if you o- officially exchange your currency in a shop, it came to nothing. So I, I, I'd gone into a supermarket to buy actually food for my dogs. And with 300 US dollars, I couldn't buy dog food. I ended up being buying two bottles of Cascade. And I was so cross. And that thing had stuck on me. So I knew that I had to deal with foodstuffs and the price of goods. Then number four, I knew that I had to deal with the collapsed social services, hospitals, uh, uh, education. You remember that time in 2008, we had dysentery and cholera and people were being brought to hospitals and they were being asked to bring water, which water had made them sick from their homes. So I knew I had to deal with the, uh, 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 the poor, the, 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 the poverty and the social indices. So my priority when we did restart, and by the way, we completed restart in two weeks. And by the 25th of February, it was ready, approved by cabinet. And by the 25th of February, I went to South Africa to present it to President Zuma, who at the time was hosting the World Economic uh, uh, Forum. And the following month, uh, the 29th of March, 2009, uh, I was asked to present uh, our, our 
blueprint, it was called STEP, we called it the Short-Term Emergency Recovery uh, Program. In a meeting of static heads of state at Lozita Palace in Swaziland, uh, and, and, and I presented it, and President Mugabe was so complimented, said, look, this man, we thought he was a lawyer, we didn't know he had these abilities, but they were shocked by the sharp period. period. Uh, I had produced this document. But to, 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 to cut a long story short, the four priorities of restart were the following. Number one, macroeconomic stability. In macroeconomic stability, I, 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 I did two things. Number one was to deal with the inflation. Number two, I quickly realized that there were so many demands in government and we didn't have money. So I coined this phrase, we eat what we kill. If we kill a rat, we eat a rat. And it's something that became a philosophy. Live within your, uh, live within your, uh, your means. So macroeconomic stability was key. Then number two, it was uh, uh, the attempt to revive the uh, industry. Uh, 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 the attempt to, uh, and I came up with the uh, various uh, programs, etc. 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 Number three, support to social services. Number four was monetization of the democratization agenda. Remember, we had to do. Uh, the COPAC program, the constitutional making programs, and other things. So restart really helped me in addressing uh, the macroeconomic uh, 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 challenges. And then, of course, uh, one of the things that I did, which I'm very proud of, uh, and because it made sense, business was lacking confidence. I started work on the 16th of February. The stock exchange was closed. I called captains of the stock exchange. I called the stock exchange committee. Mr. Munyuk and others, they refused to open the stock exchange. So I said, guys, let's have a meeting. So we had a meeting uh, on Tuesday evening. You know, I'd been used to sleeping late. I work so hard. I'm a kind of a workaholic. So I, I'd been used to working late. And during the GNU negotiations, we would start negotiating like at 9 p.m. And you'd finish negotiating at 6 a.m. So you wouldn't sleep. So I said, ah, these captains of industry, they don't know me. So I called them at 8 o'clock to start the discussions. And I said, look, we are going to sleep here. <laughs> we're not going to leave until we have an agreement. So these guys, by 10 o'clock, they were tired. So they, they, they gave in. They capitulated. And we agreed to reopen the stock exchange. So we reopened the stock exchange uh, on the 19th of February. And to make sure that it was open, I actually went to... Uh, to open the door, to ring the bells, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know myself. So I found a lot of lethargy. I found a lot of things. People who were not interested. People who had given up hope on Zimbabwe and on the economy. And so one of the things that I had to do was to say, because the Zimbabwean dollar, if you recall, it became an instrument of arbitrage. So one of the things that I had to do was to kill the Zimbabwean dollar. In other words, to completely uh, dollarized. So one of the things that we did in step was to actually pronounce the 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 the, the coffin the gravesite uh, of the Zimbabwean dollar so that to in, so that we inject uh, confidence uh, in the economy. One of the things that I also did was to liberalise the both the current account and the capital account. So when I got in in February of two thousand and nine, the country only had two hundred fifty million US dollars in 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 stock. By the time we left, we had six point five billion. US dollars, proving once more that when you shut down doors and put controls, people run away. But when you open doors and tell someone you can take 10 million US dollars out of Zimbabwe, in fact, you will not take 10 million US dollars out of Zimbabwe. You bring in 100 million US dollars because you would have shown him we can trust our economy. And so you also trust uh, your, 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 your economy. And that's exactly uh, what we did. So priority... I was so excited one day on a Friday uh, around um, the end of February. I was waiting for Ian McCauley, uh, who was the chief of staff of the prime minister at Bon Marche Shopping Center. So so as I was, he lives in Dombo so I'm waiting for him. So I decided to go into Bon Marche Shopping Center. I had 50 US dollars that my wife had uh, given me. So I, I, I then started shopping. I was shocked that I was shocked that I could fill a trolley with 50 US dollars. And then it hit me that most goods now, for a dollar, you could actually get two items or three items or four items. 
So when I went to a rally with the uh, Prime Minister Changirai and I started hearing people saying dollar for two, I actually lived it. So we, in a very short period of time, we had managed to contain inflation. And by the end of 2009, uh, inflation was actually minus seven uh, percent, uh, which was a miracle. I mean, can you imagine reducing inflation from 500 billion percent to uh, to minus seven percent? It's a miracle, but it it, it happened. Uh, we did it in 2009, and one of the things that we did as well was growth rate. The economy had lost uh, 60 percent of its value between 1997 to 2000. And eight, a 11 year period, the economy had contracted uh, by 60%. In, 2000 and, in 2008, the growth rate was minus 14%, which is almost like now. The growth rate in 2019, in, between 2019 and 2020, the Zimbabwean con economy contracted by minus 11.73%. So it's amazing how history uh, repeats uh, itself. Uh, but so but that's what we did. Priority food, priority inflation, priority microeconomic stability. Uh, that's what we did. Oh, okay, thank you so much uh, for that uh, insight. Perhaps maybe you can take the listeners through the working environment that you found, found yourself in. Uh, did you report directly to, to, to President Mugabe at that time? How were your cabinet interactions uh, during that time yeah so 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 i, I read i read uh, you know i i you know I'm a, I'm a serious reader so 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 what i realized what i realized very quickly i learned i learned like five six things number one the first thing I learned in government was to understand the power of the bureaucrat. The bureaucrat is so powerful. The apparatchik is so powerful. He can bring a government or make it work. So if you don't have a team and if you don't carry your bureaucrats, uh, they, they'll make you fall because they won't give you letters, they won't give you, they won't push. And the Minister of Finance is so huge, it's government. So, and there's so many departments. So if you don't carry everyone on board, if you don't carry directors on board, you have a problem. So there was a pressure from the party that I should bring in my own staff, my own permanent secretary. And I realized that that is just declaring a war. So one of the things that I did was to build a team. And they were like, if, you know, like eight or ten people, fantastic economics, in economics, who can walk their way into the world at any time. So we built a team um, internally indebted uh, to the permanent secretary then, uh, 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 Mr. Willard Manungo, uh, and a lot of other people. So these people, because I came from a legal background, so being a lawyer, you do things on your own. It's a silo approach. You write heads of arguments on your own. You, you research on your own. You go to court on your own. And unlike other jurisdictions like America, where lawyers act as a team, here in Zimbabwe, we don't do that. So I'd been used to doing things on my own. But in government, I realized that I needed a team. So every uh, Monday, we... Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I think it's Mpiwa's baby who was disturbing us there. All right. Okay, <laughs> yeah. So every Monday, we would, would meet and would have would come up with what we called things to do. And if you don't do your things, I'll just lose it completely. I'll just go for you. I'll just go for you. Then there were certain things that I... There were there was a lot of uh, excuses and escapism. And so one of the things in my first meeting that I did, and this is very important, in my first meeting, we had my, I had my first meeting with staff on the 17th of February which was the Tuesday, immediately after cabinet, we had our first cabinet meeting on the 17th. And that cabinet meeting was so important because if you recall, uh, the, if you recall, the Reserve Bank was issuing vouchers, $100 vouchers, uh, which were redeemable in supermarkets like Spa and so forth. So I quickly realized that this was a fake money, this was a surrogate money. And ironically, those vouchers were the forerunner to the bond notes. So I went to cabinet and I said, we have to do away with the, these vouchers because we are printing the U.S. dollar and we can't print the U.S. dollar. 
And of course, I had a press conference. This is where I was asked, where did you get money to pay uh, civil servants? And that's when I said, ah, takia, kia. And that nickname then stuck with me, <laughs> unfortunately. But anyway, to come back to the staff meeting. So I said to members of staff, I said, look, uh, I'm the only one with this with disadvantage because you know where I'm coming from. You know I'm coming from the MTC. But all of you, I don't know where you're coming from. I don't want to, I don't want to know where you're coming from. When you the Minister of Finance uh, occupied new government complex from floor number four to floor number six. So I said, once you are in the lift, and once you are in floor number four, I don't care whether you come from Roman Catholic Church or Anglican or IF, AFM. Once you are here, we, we, we are Team Zimbabwe. We, we work for Zimbabwe. I don't want to hear politics. I don't want to hear that you come from church so-and-so, church so-and-so. Once you are in the fourth floor, you are Team Zimbabwe. And people are going to come for you. People are going to attack you. Say, uh, how to resolve Zimbabwe's uh, a debt a problem. So I propose that we go the YIPIC route. YIPIC stands for Highly Indebted Poor uh, Countries Program, which I notice uh, Mutuli is also adopted. So I had Zanu PF, I think they'd caucused. The meeting lasted for hours. We got out of, we started at 9 o'clock, left cabinet around 7 o'clock at 8 p.m. with Zanu arguing that, well, we can't go YIPIC because number one, uh, when you go YPIC, you are expecting the the West to cancel and forgive your debt. But how can the West cancel and forgive your debt when we are on uh, when they've sanctioned us? Number two, we are not poor, so you can't call us uh, highly indebted and so forth. So you administer Chombo going to town. We are not poor, and then um, uh, Minister the late Stan Mudenge, he saw rest in peace. He went into philosophy. He went into it was just it's so acrimonious. So I said to them, but Minister Chombo. How can you say you are not poor when you are you as a minister you are earning hundred US dollars a month? Then they had this somebody did research for them. We showed that Zimbabwe had billions and billions worth dollars worth of minerals. And I said, but you know, those minerals are useless. We have to mine them, and that requires uh, uh, that requires uh, uh, that requires uh, you know capital which we don't have. So the long and short of it, I learned over the years that uh, there were some battles which you had to win with President Mugabe and the Prime Minister, just the two of them, and that other cabinet ministers they would read in the newspapers. Then I learned that there were battles that you had to win at the party caucus, the party cabinet caucus, and you had to come in cabinet and fight them as a, as a, as a, as a, as a party. Then I learned that there were other battles there were other battles that you had to win on your own in cabinet. That even even people from your own camp would look at you and say, you know, are you crazy? And so my legal training helped me because there were times that like I felt like I was in the constitutional court, you know, arguing. And you know, those of you who have seen me in court, I'm a very nasty character. Then over time I learned that cabinet had a very short memory, that people don't read. So so it's, I'm the implementer. I, in terms of Section 7 of the Public Finance Management Act, I, I make decisions. So I also learned that, well, look, they can resolve. Uh, but two weeks' time, they would have forgotten, and you'll implement. So just to give you an example, in 2012, they took a decision that we should buy maize. A 150 million US dollars worth of maize from Zambia. I said, but why don't we give this money to our farmers and to, to, to give credit to to cabinet? But of course, I was overridden because people wanted deals, corruption, and so forth. But I just didn't implement the decision. The other thing that I also learned in that cabinet is that you have to put everything in writing. So every month I had to I, I used to do what we called odometers, economic odometers. So I would go to cabinet and present on the state of the economy, and I would put everything. So people don't read. So sometimes people will say, ah, but you didn't tell us you were going to do this. And I said, but I told you, go to page four of your document. Miss Expander, the current uh, chief secretary to come, reads, and you'll be the first one to say, yeah, yes, uh, you put it uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the thing. 
my greatest asset was the fact that I could explain and perhaps because I'm not a, an economist, when I explain things, they become simpler. So, so colleagues could quickly, you know, you know, you know, understand that. But my God, it was a blood fight. We would fight over everything. I mean, one of the things, just to give you an example, some of the fights could be so petty. So, for instance, when we wrote Step, the working title of Step was "Making Zimbabwe Wake Again." And I had Zanu PF people coming my throat, sitting in the Why are you saying waking again? Are you saying it's dead? I said, but Minister Zimbabwe is dead. If you've got 500 billion percent inflation, it's dead. And we spent two hours fighting over, is it dead? Is it working? Why are you calling it working? Are you so, so mundane issues? So it was a struggle, a struggle, a struggle. But what I also realized, and, and there was also a lot of mistrust. You know, they used to think that I would give money to MDC ministries. So in May, I was asked by no none other than Emerson Mnangagwa, I was asked to give a breakdown of all the allocations of money that I made from February to May of 2009. And of course, you know, government is government. A, a lot of money had gone to agriculture, a lot of money had gone to uh, def soldiers, Minister of Defense, a lot of money had gone to the police, because you can't do away with the state, you can't do away with the CIOs, you can't do away with soldiers. So they were very embarrassed <laughs> when they... Yeah, so, sorry, he was asking you in what capacity? It's cabinet, so he asked me in cabinet. Oh, okay, thank you. Yeah, so I had to give a cabinet paper with the details of the allocation that I had made up to date. Because for some reason, they thought I was giving MDC ministers more money than... But it actually turned out that the ministers that had more money were naturally defense, naturally home affairs, naturally agriculture, but that's how a country is run, you know, <laughs> you know, so, you know, you know, and it was, it was Minister Mnangagwa. So, so now, now that you have mentioned him, what was your relationship like with him throughout that time? Ah, an excellent, it was a, it was a, so, so there were two ministers that uh, I always used to go to their offices. Uh, so, uh, so it was Minister of Defense because, you know, you were senior to me and you was like my father in terms of seniority. So I felt it would be rude to ask him to come to my to my office. So I would go to his uh, I would go to his uh, you know you know you know office and we were trying to downsize the army and also increase also increase uh, the salaries of of the soldiers and I always knew that the army was sensitive so I, I would go to his office. The other minister would go to his office but for different reasons was Obed Mpofu. Because Obed Mpofu had millions and millions of dollars that were coming to from diamonds for instance in 2010 he had 270 million us dollars but getting the 274 million dollars nothing came i ended up getting five million dollars so i'd go to his office and say minister Mpof, i want our money i want our money i want our money and the only minister i reported to robert mugabe was was obed Mpof. president this man is <laughs> not accounting to our money he's not accounting <laughs> fight and fight and fight. I have no time for Obed Mpofu. He is not my friend and anyone who considers Obed Mpofu a friend of Zimbabwe, he is not. So I used to have... So what happened to the diamond money? Look, the Zimbabwe uh, diamond, uh, alluvial diamond deposits in Marange should have lasted us for 25 years. We became the world's fifth, fifth largest producer of diamonds. We were exporting billions. Under the Kimberley processing team, uh, uh, there were two accessors that were appointed. One was Mr. Chikani from South Africa, and one was a Belgian national called uh, uh, Matt Boxbeck. They would, so before Zimbabwe exported, those two gentlemen would sign off. So I would get figures of the exports. They ran into billions. But you then ask MMCZ, you then ask the Minister of uh, Mines, account for this man, it never came. It never came. So I began to sound like a broken uh, record. So the estimates of 15 billion US dollars announced by President Mugabe that we lost, I think it's a drop in the ocean. Uh, we lost the, uh, we lost the, uh, more uh, than 15 billion US so, so when you reported to President Mugabe, what would he, how would he respond to that? Did he take any action? 
Did he give you any feedback on what is going on? In some of the meetings, you, you wouldn't come. Some of the meetings, you'd be coming, you'd be shaking, you'd be shivering, you, you'd, be, you'd be uncertain. If you push the issue in the cabinet, you'd drink lots of water. You... He's a strange man, that one. Mzala, please. Can I just... <laughs> I did I I can sit here all day and listen to you. Uh, the way you 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 narrate uh, everything is quite exciting. Uh, but just for the the listeners, uh, one of the books that Rutendai mentioned is The Heart of Darkness, and that is uh, authored by O Joseph Conrad. Am I right to yes. that tonight? Yes, Joseph yes, Conrad. So. Yes. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> yeah. So if you can, please pick that one up. Tonight, you know what? You gave praise to a team that you worked so well with, in the, you know, and the fact that you were nonpartisan in in the way you approached your role here as finance minister. Um, but there was something that you touched on around e bond and um, dollarization, and I, you know, I need to to pick on you on this one because there was something that was mentioned around U, U Patrick Chinamasa. So some people say that you cannot be credited for e dollarization of the economy at that time. So I didn't, I, you know, can you expand a bit more around that? What was happening at the time, and what are you actually accountable for? Well, I mean, it's 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 a. Uh, you see, in two thousand and eight, two thousand and seven, the Zimbabwean economy dollarized. So people started trading in U.S. dollars and in rand. I remember going with my wife to, to, to Nyanga, to Nyamaropa, in 2008. And we stopped to buy a packet of potatoes. You know, Nyanga makes some of the best potatoes in Zimbabwe. So we stopped. There were 10 U.S. dollars or 100 rands. So, so dollarization had taken place in the in the economy. The government of national unity started on the sixteenth of February, 20, 2009. On the twenty ninth of January, the acting minister of finance, Chinamas, announced a budget. In that budget, he introduced the U.S. dollar alongside the Zimbabwean dollar. So, so that, is, that is where the source of the mischief that I introduced the Zimbabwean uh, dollar. And as I said, when we started work on the 16th of February, the Zimbabwean dollar was there, but in the form of the vouchers that I uh, discontinued on the 17th of February, because they, I knew they were a fiat currency, I knew they were a quasi current which is why in step one of the things that i did which i'm so proud of was to say we've completely de-dollarized there's now a a, a, a monocurrency in zimbabwe which is essentially the u.s dollar and the rand and that is what we 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 we, we did this time on it the u.s dollar on its own is not a panacea I left government in 2013. When I left government, Chinamasa was the Minister of Finance. The U.S. dollar was the monocurrency up until February of 2019, when the government, uh, when the government, uh, enacted SI 33 of 2019, and then suddenly we're told uh, our money is gege gege with the U.S. dollar is gege gege with the RTG dollar. So. So the introduction of one currency alone is not a source of macroeconomic stability. You have to do other things. And what we did so well in the government of national unity was to maintain discipline, was to maintain fiscal consolidation, was to maintain the philosophy, we eat what we kill, number one. Number two, corruption. Corruption kills. And now everyone can see. And we are going to talk about the current economy. Two-thirds of our current problems are coming from corruption. Two-thirds of the growth in money supply is coming from corruption. Corruption that is being monetized. 
and increasing a broad demand supply by a factor of over 135%. So the dollar was not a panacea, but the dollar gave us a fighting chance which coupled with the necessary hygiene, the necessary micro and macro measures which we took, we stabilized the Zimbabwean economy. Not only did we just stabilize the Zimbabwean economy, we actually grew the Zimbabwean economy. In 2011, the Zimbabwean economy grew by 12%, the highest in the history of our country, the highest in our in the in the world at the time. So 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 we you know no one can take away that record from us. And key was macroeconomic stability, key was discipline, key was the paying attention to the economy, paying attention to the economy and responding to the economy. I'm also going to ask you another, uh, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if I should say it's controversial, but I'm hoping you'll indulge us on this one. Of course, uh, of course, you... of course. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, you know, you touched on the corruption and everything. And Mzala, help me out on this one, because I want to touch on e- the sanctions part. Um, you know, uh, we speak, the people have spoken of Izidera, they've spoken about pictures of you with American Congress people you know, and uh, economic problems being uh, as a result of the, the whole sanctions thing. So can you help demystify that part and, and your role in it for us? So, many of you may remember that when we, when the government of national unity was suspended, so it was was formed. Zimbabwe's membership of the IMF had actually been suspended. And it had been suspended because around 2006, 2007, 2006, the Arab EZ mobbed foreign currents into the system and went and paid the IMF. So so the IMF was cross with that, with 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 the with the effect on the on banks and so forth. So Zimbabwe's uh, voting rights at the IMF was suspended. So one of the biggest things that I had to deal with was to restore Zimbabwe's voting rights. So for the entirety of 2009, I was toing and froing between Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C. My final meeting on this point was a board meeting that was held in February of 2009. And I remember the cabinet meeting. It had to be suspended and people had to say, look, you go and fight. And I've got these amazing pictures when I'm at, at Washington, D.C. with Secretary Manungo because I was actually asked and presented the, uh, a position that I was actually asked to address the board of the IMF whether Zimbabwe's voting rights would be removed or not. And fortunately, we succeeded. So it's one of the greatest things that we did, but that's not uh, acknowledged because we received Zimbabwe's, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, uh, uh, you know, voting rights. We then formed a re-engagement committee. That re-engagement committee was chaired by Patrick Namasa, and it had its members: Nicholas Goche from Zanu PF, Elton Mangoma from the MDC, and myself, uh, Priscilla Mushonga from MDC, a uh, Green, and uh, Professor Welshman. The issues that were alive in the discussions across the group, this committee went to Brussels, this committee went to the United Kingdom, this committee went to to the Scandinavians. Honorable uh, Mshonga, as you know, is was very active and very passionate about these things. They went to the United States of America, they went to the things that were raised which things are still being raised with the following issues. Number one, can you sort out issues around the rule of law, issues around protection of private property rights, issues around the security of the person? Why do you kill each other? Why do you beat each other? Eh, eh, you know, you know, you know, you know, you know, why is there violence in your country? Why, are they, why is there an even and an equal application of the law in your country? Why does it appear that there is rule by law? Why does it appear that some people are above the law? That's number one. Number two, the issues around 
contested elections? Why can't you have free and fair elections like everyone else? Number three, issues around the media. Can you explain why 42 years, 38 years after independence, you still have one broadcasting house and so forth? Number four, issues around weaponization of food, weaponization of traditional leaders, and, 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 and so forth. Those issues were asked of us. Those issues are asked of us today as, as, as a country. And so Zimbabwe must address these issues to end or rather to enjoy the, the fraternity of the globe at a large. If we want to be an equal member of the international community, then we have to play by the rules. Unfortunately, Zimbabwe wants to have its cake and eat it. It's playing cricket. And in cricket, you only do two things. Either you are bowling, fielding, or betting. You don't go and carry out a rugby, a rugby tackle in a cricket field. And that is the problem with Zimbabwe. So I always say, the biggest sanction we have in Zimbabwe is misgovernance. The biggest sanction we have in Zimbabwe is the rule of law, the abuse of the rule of law. The biggest problem which we have in Zimbabwe is a leadership that is not alive to the basic tenets of good governance, to the obligation to treat their people with the uh, decency. Last week, we were, the, we were in the news for the wrong reason, banning banks. Who bans bank lending? You know, it's, it's, it's ridiculous. Last week, we were in the news for, 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 for wrong reasons. The arrest of Dara Blessed Mshlanga and the a, a young female journalist, Chidi Chengeto. Who does that? Who does that? So these are the things that we need to address. These are the things that Zimbabwe needs to confront. Whether in 2009, when I was Minister of Finance, or now Namshla Katesi, we need to address these things. They are the elephants in the living room. Uh, Mr. B, I I mean, I have to ask this one. <laughs> uh, who bans uh, loans from banks? I mean, you've mentioned Uti, you also had to put controls in place to deal with our hyperinflation, the currency and everything. Um, I So are you saying the, the decision that was made uh, wasn't well thought of? Uh, the, I mean, the recent decision around loans being stopped, because obviously it was reversed. Quite it's, 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 it's insanity. It's it's ridiculous. You know, there was a meeting. There was a meeting at the World Bank last week on Wednesday on some divisional heads. They could hold that meeting, but they were laughing. Who, who banned the bank? So, but then hold on. Let me ask you this question. Um, so would you say our economy is captured by private individuals or by entities when you think of uh, our loans and all of that? Tendai, are you still around? Mzala, I think we've managed to break the internet. Do you want to jump in there quickly whilst he grabs water and so do I? You um, I don't know what's going on. Are you there, uh, Honorable Bidi? Yes, I'm there. Okay, thank you. Maybe let's tie these issues nicely. Um, let's move to point five of our talking points. What is, in your view, what is the current state of our economy? Maybe let's start from there. It's, it's a complete disaster. It's a complete dog's breakfast. I want to start by inflation. You know, if the if your listeners, I want you to go and read the IMF Article Four report that came out on the eighth of April, twenty twenty two. It's it's a shocking document because normally the IMF is nice on government because it wants to do business uh, on them. The IMF says our inflation in 2020 was 837%. Now, if we say it, they will say, ah, look, the opposition is speaking.
837%. Now, that's a terrible figure. That's a terrible figure. The IMF also says the growth rate, 2019-2020, Zimbabwe's economy, she rank by 11.7%. And the IMF uses the word Zimbabwe has been in a deep recession. Now, that's 2020. I come to 2022. The happening in 22-22 is nothing compared to 2020. Things are terrible. If you go into a supermarket right now, a packet of meat is 20, 26,000 RTGS. A bottle of cooking fat is 7 US dollars. Bread has gone up. Fuel, Our fuel is the most expensive uh, in, in, you know, in, in the world. A, a bottle of uh, a Mazoe Cordial is over 5 US dollars. A bottle of uh, sugar, sugar has gone up. So prices are raping our people in Zimbabwe. And I reckon that in the last two weeks alone, our inflation has gone above 80% above 80 percent now once you have month on month inflation of 80 percent you have you have hyperinflation the definition of hyperinflation is month on month inflation of 80 percent so if we were 837 percent in 2020 in 2022 we'll be 1000 and once you are 1000 you are in no man's territory you are back to 2008 now in 2008 why did we have inflation in 2008 with inflation because the economy was overheating with a crisis of over accumulation too much money chasing too few goods what is inflation at the end of the day inflation at the end of the day is the existence of too much paper money broad money uh, m3 the government says last week we'll control reserve money we'll keep reserve money at zero but the reserve money is not the challenge the challenge is m3 broad money. Who is manufacturing broad money? There's a lot of money in this economy. There's a lot of money in this economy. And in March and April, a lot of money was generated in the economy, which caused the spike. And I'll come to that. I'll come to that. So I was talking about inflation. One of the challenges of inflation is that the pricing system itself, uh, Umzala, is, is crazy. You've got a multi-tire pricing system in Zimbabwe, and no economy can exist given that disequilibrium. So you've got the the same good we have a price in rand, the same good we have a price in US dollar cash, the same good we have a price in RTGS, the same good we have a price in on, on Zipit, the same good we have a price on Echo Cash, the same good we now have a, a price. On, on the echo case US dollar a, a, a platform. Now, in addition to a multi-tire pricing system, we now have a multi-tire exchange rate regime. So we've got the auction rate. Then we've got the open market willing buyer, willing seller, which we know doesn't exist. Then we have got the parallel market, the black market, uh, 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 you know, in you know, Fourth Street. Then we have got uh, the blended rate, which supermarkets are using. And different supermarkets are using different rates. So if you go to OK Bazaars, the rate at OK Bazaars is not the same rate you are getting at pick and pay in the same city. Try it tomorrow in Bulawayo. Try it tomorrow in Kwekwe. Try it tomorrow in Harare. There is no country that can, can, can survive this multi-tire pricing system, this multi-tire exchange uh, 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 system. Then I come to the exchange rate itself. It's shooting. I, I wrote a tweet in January of 2022 and many Varakashi said, ah, you are crazy. I said the rate will read 500 by June. In fact, I was I was wrong. It hit 500 by May. We're still in May. We're still in May, by the way. Yet in, 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 in June. And trust me, by December of 2022, it would have reached the 1,000. So we're in no man's land. We're in, in, in no man's land. It's like a it's like a kick and hope football. I grew up supporting a very poor football team called Black Rhinos. And Umzala, you know that we had two strikers. One was called Maronga Nyangela, and the other one was called Jerry Zungushidao. What the Rhinos de defenders would do, Simon A.K. Mugabe, Simon, sorry, Pandu, Sanduka Pakamisa, what they would do is just hit the ball forward and hope that it will hit the head of Jerry Zungushidao. Or Maringa Nyangela, the bomber, and it will go into the nets. That's not football. 
That's not economics. Economics is not a game of feja feja. It is not marabout, isangoma, ndunge, or whatever ngangas that they go to in Chipinge or in Jelele. It's not that. Economics is a science. It's a science of logic. Now, here in Zimbabwe, we have a problem. There is too much money. They are generating too much money. So in 2000, in, in March, we had money financing the by-elections. Nobody has told us what the by-elections cost. I think that they would have cost us around one US $120 million. That money is given to suppliers. They sell the money. In RTGS dollars, they go on the black market to monetize it. But the biggest form of the increase in money supply is in fact the Dutch auction system, which is rigged. The auction system is a cesspool of corruption. Elites are going there to access the money. Until recently, the auction system was selling 40 million US dollars a week. If you multiply 40 million times 52 weeks that are there in a year, you get to something like 2.5 billion US dollars. So when you generate 2.5 billion US dollars, it is converted on the black market because you are those who are buying it are buying it at a, at a premium. For two years, the Dutch auction system was introduced in June of 2020. For two years, it has been averaging 1 is to 83, yet the black market has been 1 is to 60. So it has been operating at a discount, a premium of 100%. Now it's almost 200, 300%. So it means that the commodification of the US dollar has created massive arbitrage, massive rent-seeking behavior. But that rent-seeking behavior, unfortunately for you and me, is monetized. It's put back in the system as RTGS dollars. Then you've got corruption. You've got tenders. The Bait Bridge to Arare Road is being built by some, some, some. I was going to call them sorties, but I, I won't do that. Those people are being paid in RTGS dollars. What do they do? They take that money, go and buy uh, the US uh, uh, the US uh, dollar because it's a safe currency. They go and buy shares on the Zimbabwe Stock Exchange because they're a safer uh, haven. So it's a crisis of overaccumulation. Too much money chasing too, too few goods. But the government is the biggest creator of this uh, uh, arbitrage. They're printing RTG, uh, sorry, they're printing money through through treasury bureaus. And and when you when you issue a treasury bureau in a dollarized economy, you are in fact printing money. The holders of the of the treasury bill will discount the treasury bill. They use the proceeds to go on Fourth Street to go and buy uh, the, the 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 U.S. dollar. So you have an overheated economy. Here's what I found. You have a crisis of overaccumulation, and that will lead to one thing and one thing alone: an economic recession. An economic recession is defined in economics as two quarters of negative growth rate. But once you have more than a year, two years, it becomes an economic depression. So we are entering into another phase of an economic recession. And it's going to be worse because next year is election year. Next year is going to be election year. They're going to monetize election promises. They're going to buy, they're going to increase salaries, even in US dollar terms. You saw them last week now saying they're going to give 30% of deliveries of maize in US dollars. They are going to buy uh, vehicles for 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 people uh, that they think they met, including traditional uh, leaders. So we are going to remain stuck in this, uh, 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 you know, you know, economy. So so to 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 answer you in very simple terms, this is an economy in deep uh, crisis. And we, when you look at the figures, when you look at the at the graph, I'm always amazed that Mutuli Ngube can actually and is doing disastrously worse than Patrick uh, uh, Chinamasa. So I submit that he's an economist, but on paper alone, because his figures and his logic is not consistent with someone who actually was kept by some poor vice chancellor somewhere in a degree in economics or in financial economics. It's a disaster. A, a dog's breakfast, but one week which many dogs, including my own dogs, would not touch, not by a long mile. It's a complete disaster. And I haven't mentioned unemployment. I haven't mentioned the state of the infrastructure. I've just touched on macroeconomic 
stability. There is no macroeconomic stability. There's macroeconomic disequilibrium. We have gone back to the days of hyperinflation. We have gone back to the days of shortages. Goods are disappearing uh, from the shelves. We have gone back to the to the to the days where people increase prices for the sake of increasing prices. We have gone back to an economy controlled by cartels. The biggest being the Z Corona DC Insco Group, which is now ten percent of our economy, and these guys increase prices wherever they want. So it's a disaster, my friends, a complete disaster, a disaster in capital letters. Okay, thank you so much for that. But uh, perhaps our listeners would want to understand. You have worked in government. You understand how the systems work. These are like you refer to Professor Nube. Uh, we have the likes of uh, Kuvama Tanga and all. These are technocrats. These are prof a, these exactly. are professionals. A complete disaster. <laughs> yes, these are qualified, I mean, technical people. What informs their policies? Are they not aware of what they are uh, is is obtaining on the ground? Is it deliberate? Is it ignorance? Is it incompetence? What really drives those policies that are so disastrous? I think part of the problem with this uh, so-called Second Republic has been that has been the problem of the decision-making matrix. So if, if you don't make, if you make a decision, it must be in the best interest of the people of Zimbabwe. It must be in the best interest of the economy. So if, if that decision-making matrix applied, they wouldn't have de-dollarized in February of 2009 because we simply did not have the conditions for the return of the Zimbabwean dollar. For instance, we didn't have reserves. Our current account was, was, in, was in deficit. Uh, we didn't have political confidence that is necessary and requisite to support our own currency. But they implemented this decision not because of, of economics, but because of the bottom line. So the biggest problem that I have with this government is that it makes decisions based on two things and two things alone. Number one, the power retention agenda. Does this decision help us to retain power? which is a tragedy, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt because most governments in the world do that. But what most governments don't do in the world is the second decision-making matrix of this, of this regime, which is every decision that is made is made on the basis of the bottom line. I found this on the web. It's made on the basis of corruption. What is in it for us? So, when you analyze every decision, uh, you won't understand it unless you make you connect the dots and realize that this dollar is going to Mr. So and So's pocket. So start with the decision of dollarization. Once you commodify the US dollar, it means that those who can access the US dollar are going to be millionaires. And and so Anyone with control of the of the of the reserve bank will control the US dollar. They've emasculated the the reserve bank. So much so that announcement that ought to be made by the reserve bank, three quarters of the announcement that were made by that were made uh, uh, by Mr. Menangago on the 7th of May were in fact the reserve bank announcement, but he made them because they have captured the reserve bank. And why have they captured the reserve bank? Because it controls the US dollar. The auction system. They've been controlling it. If you look at the people who have been getting money from the Reserve Bank, you'll be shocked when you go behind the names in that plethora of shelf companies. It's the who's who of, of ZANU-PF. The same applies to Zamco. Zamco bought non-performing loans uh, from major banks uh, two years ago at the taxpayer's expense. Two billion US dollars was used. They've refused up until now to disclose the names of the persons and the characters whose non-performing loans were bought. But you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that is the entire political bureau, the entire central committee uh, of, the, of the ruling party. So decisions are made on the basis of the bottom line. How do you explain 
the granting of the monopoly to Zubko. You only understand that if you now understand who actually is behind Zubko, who is actually benefiting, <coughs> who actually has been buying buses uh, from uh, from Belarus. They privatized the First Mutual Life. They forced the uh, they forced the uh, NASA to sell its shares in First Mutual Life. You won't understand this unless you understand who actually is the purchaser. They've privatized the uh, 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 the the country's sole refinery fidelity uh, printers, and they've sold it to a company called uh, Kuvimba. Who actually is Kuvimba? Uh, you need to know that. Uh, they've they've sold the uh, Zim Alloys. They've sold the BMC. Who actually are all these characters? They've sold two banks, privatized two banks, including a uh, Zim Bank. Who actually is behind this? So we are in this war, um, um, Dala Umzan because of greed, because of corruption, because of a group of men and women that put greed, aggrandizement, uh, avarice beyond Zimbabwe, beyond the interests of Zimbabwe. But don't also rule out incompetence. Don't also rule out uh, irrationality. Some would call it madness. The decision to ban banks has nothing to do with uh, someone's profit line. Someone's profit margin, margins is just pure, raw, undiluted insanity. It has no basis at all in science. Even Kunganga Kawanoenda, I don't think it's begged by, by any, any Sangoma, any marabout. It's pure irrationality. So if you have got a government arrested by the demon of the power retention agenda, arrested by the demon of capture, and greed arrested by the demon of incompetence and irrationality. God forgive that country. God forgive Zimbabwe. I, I feel pity for the ordinary citizen.